All right. Uh, so, guys, we had Cam Joss on today. We had a staff development. It was awesome on our end. Unfortunately, a lot of it got kind of chopped and screwed. I shouldn't say a lot, but about the first half of it. So I'm going to go through a couple things that you guys missed. Um, more or less kind of probably the first about – First, about 15 minutes is is going to be it, it's it's fine. There's nothing there's nothing too bad with it. Some of it kind of gets a little choppy, uh, but it's it's certainly you can hear at the uh, the last 50 minutes of it is completely clear. There's no issues at all. So we kind of figured it out through a little ways. But really, the stuff that you guys missed that that, that was really good is, is first off, Cam just came out with a book. Um, he co co uh, wrote it with. Uh, Con, uh, what's his name? Fergus, Fergus, Connelly. Fergus Connelly. Um And so that's out. It's going to be a, a series book, but Cam kind of explained that. Um, and if you guys have read Game Changer, it's kind of a, a building off of that of continuing how to program conditioning and, and the games that they're they're doing and um, how to do those things. So that that was that was kind of a part of it. But obviously, you know, Cam is highly intelligent, and, and Fergus has his own reputation. So um, obviously, recommend you guys pick it up. And, and I know I can't wait to get my hands on it and read it as well. The first part, the first question that I that I asked Cam was, um, we well, we I guess we just kind of got into talking about um, how he kind of would would work some of those things in, and, and what we talked about is just co coaches and the position coaches and trusting them, um, and how a lot of a lot of a big mistake a lot of strength coaches make is they don't trust their position coaches, and and we talk about how they understand movement better than we think, but to lean on them a little bit and ask them questions. Um, about their style, about how they coach, uh, and really other than that, guys, there, there, there's not a not a, a ton of stuff that you guys missed. Um, do you guys have notes or anything particular you guys want to point out? Uh, yeah, I mean, just during that section about the sport coaches, the notes I wrote down that I thought were really good is, is that the sport coaches do know the movement; they just don't know their knowledge as biomechanics. They they know it as sport movement and, and they know it in that realm. But the truth of the matter is, it is it's exactly what we talk about, just different terminology. Um, so, you know, go along with that coach or Cam, you know, he, he said, talk their language, don't make it your language, you know, use their language that they understand and, and tell, talk to them about what you want to talk to them about based on movement. Yeah. And I think if I could add anything to that, you know, don't, don't try to impress them with your strength coach jargon, just speak yeah. their language and everything gets, uh, it makes better off because of that. Yeah, so I mean, you guys look at the gist. Like I said, it'll it'll if you listen to this whole thing straight through, you'll you'll hear because we kind of where we edited it a little bit, so it kind of chops a couple times. Uh, but within those edits, I, I put them in there for a reason because a lot of really good things were said. Um, so you know, once again, you, you, it's it's certainly doable. You can you can listen to the whole thing if you don't feel like dealing with it and listening. To it, there's just an echo in the background. Um, if you guys don't feel like dealing with it, just fast forward to about the 15 minute mark, and from there on, the rest of it is is smooth and clean. Um, just doesn't have any of the video on his side. It was just all the audio parts. So uh, enjoy the episode, guys. I, I'm, I, you know, please hang in there and listen to it because there is a ton of really, really good stuff. Um, apologize for for the the technical difficulties. I, I do believe we have it all figured out here going forward. Obviously, we're still kind of figuring this thing out, getting the the video attached with this and um, skyping in with other people. So apologies for that. Uh, but once again, a ton of great content, and, and I think we got this problem solved moving forward with, with making sure that we don't have any of these issues anymore. So uh, looking forward to the next guest as well. But, guys, enjoy this one. I'm going to have any questions. Thanks. Appreciate you coming, taking some time to hang out with us here today. I know uh, you and I talk, obviously, very often. Um, but a lot of exciting things obviously going on for you today, which has kind of been uh, the premise of a lot of our conversations. But for those of you guys that don't know, and I don't even know if you guys all know, but obviously you just published a book, which is uh, a freaking huge deal. So congratulations on that. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Um, but anyways, I think that that's probably a good place to start because um, obviously there's a lot of very progressive ideas in the book. Um, I think a lot of things that we have talked about and – um, you want to just kind of spend a, a couple minutes just kind of talking about what, you know, what the point of the book is, what message you're trying to get across, what people can find in, in the book and, um, some of the ideas and philosophies. Have a nice conversation. Yeah. I think the, the new, the new thing that I'm starting to try to find as quickly as possible, I think when, when I was younger and really trying to, I was just trying to learn new things that would make us better. Um, whereas now it's like, it's what, I think it's how I respond to every single one of your text messages. Like, well, what is the balance? And I think that's what I'm trying to, to really find now is 
you know, like GPS is great. And we were just talking to Mississippi State strength staff last week. It's great, but there's a balance there. And if you're just, oh, this is a GPS and this is all we do now, um, I think you're missing it if you don't understand the balance of it. You know, if you discover velocity-based training and you're like, holy shit, this is the best stuff ever. Yeah, it's, it's a good tool, but what is the balance? Um, organizing this information, you certainly could over-organize it and probably unnecessarily over-organize it for coaches if you don't find the balance. So, like, for me, I feel like when I look back at my career, I've always ex- – I've, I've found something I liked and I've been all in on it. And I always do the exact same thing. After a couple years, it kind of it doesn't fade away, but it fades back to what is the balance and what I really truly believe in. And so I think now, probably more differently, I analyze ideas a little more uniquely in the sense that when I read and I, I try to absorb and apply things, I, I immediately now I think to myself, what is the balance? Where is the middle ground? Where does that lie? And I try to get there a whole hell of a lot quicker than I used to. Yeah, no, that's that's a yeah. phenomenal point. I'm really glad you on each thing individually. But then when you look at the collective whole of everything we're doing, it's a lot of work, right? And it's just it's more of a summation effect rather than looking at things in isolation. Like you have to figure out what's the balance of volume to get the summation effect that you want in terms of improving all these different qualities. Like team sports are complex, man. There's so many different qualities that go into it. And Ultimately, we don't get that much time. Like, what you guys get, what, eight hours a week uh, in the off season total? Eight hours. Yep. It, so it's just, it's really not that much time when you think about it. So, how do we make the best of that time and make sure we're touching all these different areas? And that's where the balance lies. And so, you know, people will look at my program, they'll see that I might only do like six total sprints. And then, that includes like warm-up sprints or they'll be like, you're only doing like four sets of a lift, like a primary lift, you know, but I'm like, you have to understand. It's like, I'm doing all this other work and and I'm putting myself through these workouts too. And like, I know by the time I get to the weight room after being on the field for half an hour, 40 minutes sometimes, and I want to do another lift for another like half an hour, 40 minutes. Like by the time I get to the the weight room, like, you know, my 80% now feels a lot more like 90, but so I got to cut down on the intensity and the volume, but I can still get some good work in there, keep the quality high. And it's just part of the balance of the whole thing. So I love that you said that. Yeah. And the, the next thing that I'm super interested in, I know, you know, you haven't been able to play with much GPS stuff. We just, you know, we, we collected some normative data in the spring and then now we're pretty heavy into it. Um, like I said, I mean, we're, we're doing some things with the information, but more than anything, we're collecting data. You know, like what does a normal Tuesday, Wednesday practice look like as far as player load goes? Um, what is a progressive, you know, what, what is it? What is, you know, we're just finding out like, you know, our offensive players in general have significantly higher player load than our defense because our offense, the kind of offense we run, they're running 90 to 100 plays a game. Our defense is running like 40 to 50. So, um, there's some very unique things there in what is Buffalo's normal, you know, but what I'm super interested in is I want to get those GPSs on these guys during one of our sprint days, you know, on a day that we go out there and do sprint mechanics for 25 minutes and then do six, you know, full speed sprints and three heavy sled pulls and then come in here and do uh, some dynamic box band speed squats, some RDLs. Like I want to know what that player load is that day. Um, And I think that we can start to, get a really a truly a better idea of of one how to truly progress them throughout the entire year in the annual plan um and then also get an idea of hey like is what is it what is a tempo conditioning day like what is that what is that player load um obviously we know we know the volume you know like we know the the amount of 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 yardage they're accumulating but things like high speed yardage things like uh, like I said, overall player load, those are things that we're still trying to quantify and figure out. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to take this normative data and start to really apply it. We'll kind of play around with it in the wintertime and see what those workouts are like. But in the summertime, I'm hoping that we're like cooking. We know we have an exact model of how we're going to progress all of those things all the way up into the first day of camp. Yeah. I love that you brought that up too, because, um, you know, uh, a lot of people are, you know, what's our job as a strength and conditioning staff or physical preparation staff, whatever you want to call yourself, really it comes down to we have to ensure, like, ensure that the players are fit enough to 
play the game as the, as the games can be played for them, right? So, so for you guys, it comes down to how can we make sure our players are fit enough to handle the practice of Buffalo and play in the game in the MAC conference against the opponents we're going to like, how do we make sure that they're fit enough to handle their fit enough? So I think you're, what you just said is, is phenomenal because what you're looking at now is now not, you know, like there's buzzwords in the field, right? There's force velocity profiling. It's like that. It's that, it's that, it's, you know, like movement is like culture. It's got to be daily. And I think that that exposure in some form or fashion, that's where we, I think you've really got me thinking about. I think I was more progressive in nature before where it's like, okay, January, February is strictly this, um, you know, March is strictly this, June is strictly this, July is strictly this. But I think in some form or facet, that exposure needs to be relatively constant, um, which I think we know that in the weight room, right? Like I think you talk to any strength coach, I think for the most part, we're doing a pretty good job of understanding that, yeah, you can have a hypertrophy phase, but there still has to be some max effort movement in that to not lose that quality. I think we understand that concept in the weight room as a as a industry pretty well, but I think movement wise, I don't know that I see that still. And I think that's what you and I were talking about last time you were here. Um, as I was kind of analyzing your all the things that you talked about, I was like, yeah, but I don't know if it's progressive enough. And now that I've kind of went back and thought about those things, I think you need to have things you emphasize. I still think postseason you need to emphasize biomechanical patterns that are going to put these guys in a good position to build a frame off of, but there still needs to be those other elements of exposure or else those qualities are going to start dwindling just like in the weight room. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not any different. So I think we've done a great job of understanding weight room stuff, but I think on, on the movement stand P or stand, we're still kind of trying to figure that out. Um, and that's like where, I, where, I, where I've asked so many questions about the games and um, how to do those things. But, there needs to constantly be that, you know, what Coach Coach McNally, who kind of does all of our GPS stuff here, um, runs all of our things. It's like we, we constantly talk about exposure. But well, once we eliminate that exposure, uh, chances of injury or, or risk of injury is going to go up. We know that. Um, so how can we intelligently expose them to those stimuluses in January, in February, to prep them for spring ball? Um, and I think that's uh, that's the – really the next question or the next, I guess the next things that I want to talk about with you is what is that level, you know? Yeah, no, that's, yeah. I love uh, your head right with that because that's exactly what I'm right, looking right, about right, right, you know, as well. Yeah, and, and we touched on this well, on the, is, uh, it, it, there's, there's, it's so there's multifactorial when we're talking about, when we're talking about that's to make sure that we expose our players to. Uh, I think the other thing too, that Heist and I were actually just talking about, was like how can we create more anxiety when it comes to competition inside of an off-season program um like we you know we we're just we we're using like cramping as an example we know our guys are all very well hydrated and obviously the, the research on what's causing cramping is is uh is starting to open up some people's minds to this but you know a lot of it is not necessarily hydration based I'd, i would argue that most of it is not hydration based nowadays and college football uh, but I think there's some some hay wiring going on at the neuromuscular junction and um, you know they're, they're neuromuscular exertional type cramps um, but I think some people think of that as just physical like you know physically they're they're exhausted but I think a lot of that has to do with the mental stress of because I mean when is a, when is the most cramping happen that you've seen as you know as a coach for me this is what Heisen and I were talking about it's the first couple games because there's still that anxiety um, of what a football game is. And I, and so we were just talking about, you know, like things like using these games that you and I've talked about and um, how can we create those games in a more high pressure situation? What can we put on the line? Um, even to an extent of maybe you hype it up all week and then have big game Friday and you post the competitions, um, you post the winners on social media. I mean, I don't know, just ways to make it feel more like a game day. Um, and if we can't, you know, once again, create that exposure, that stimulus, uh, have all the position coaches out there, find a way to make it, uh, like I said, high, high stimulus from an from a anxiety standpoint. And that's the other thing that I've, I've wanted to, to talk to you about with that aspect of it. Dude, I, I was, what you just said was genius, man, because uh, something we talk about in the book is, you know, just think about how, 
everybody's talking about mental toughness, right? Like you want to have mentally tough players, but as you and I both know, mental toughness has nothing to do with carrying a log on your shoulder for five miles. You know what I mean? Like it's not about just like holding a plank for two hours. It's about how can I respond to the stress that I have to deal with in my situation when it's at its most stressful position, right? So they like coaches say all the time, like great players make great plays in big time moments, right? That's the stress that we're talking about, right? And how do we get them to deal with that anxiety? It's we got to put them in game like situations to do that. That's how we build that mental, you know, blank if you want to call it to those moments and uh, really see what guys are made of in, in the context of the game. Because if you're exposing them to a game situation and they're not trying to compete, guess what? When they're in practice, they're not trying to compete in practice because that's just how they are. And we need to be able to see the psychological side of our game. So, I, for one, I can admit this. When I was in college, I lived for the weight room. I lived for all of the physical prep room. When it came time in practice to do a one-on-one, I was trying to sit in the back of the line. You know, I wasn't trying to get out there and go against our best receiver because I knew I was going to get exposed, and I was afraid of that. That was a psychologically, you know, that was a psychological fault that I had as an athlete, right? And so that's something I could have worked on better, and uh, that's something that we can expose our athletes to because what you said about the cramping, that's another thing that's huge right there um, because you know, I love, like, Robert Sapolsky's work because he's just kind of showing us how – now, there's really no difference between psychological and physical because they're just utterly intertwined, right? So, your mentality is going to affect your physiology just as your physiology. Your physiology. So, um, what you said, so something to write about in the book is we say, think about the first time you ever did anything new. Ride a bike or try to learn a new skill situation. You're just with it because you don't know how to control that situation. You're controlling things you have to do yet. You know, or even like maybe yeah. drive the car on the back road now uh, out on the high of the car, right? That's a whole new conceptual environment. Like, yeah, I know how to drive a car, but I haven't driven on the highway yet. So, you know, these guys that are doing all these footwork drills and things like that in isolation, great. You know how to move with the external movements of a defensive back, but can you cover somebody when that dude's trying to compete and beat you and get that, that ball caught over your head, right? So that's that's where – now we have to look at it from uh, a psychological stress standpoint and how we can get them to deal with that, become accustomed to that. That's going to help their physiology and help them physically. Because a lot of times when we see these non-contact injuries, I'm of the belief. That's a pretty low hanging fruit for sure. And, and I would say probably the most, you know, one of the, one of the larger things I see overlooked is I think we progress through that so rapidly and quickly. <sighs> Um, and we want to get we want to get into those sled sprints. We want to get into those um, wicked sprints so quickly, and we could definitely spend significantly more time on just positional work um, and working on posture and working on those kind of things that I think would help significantly um, with, with that. So uh, I definitely agree. What What do you think is one of the bigger mistakes? that you see or you talk to coaches and you're like, man, that's a, the, the biggest mistake you see that you think coaches are making or as you're writing your book, what's something that you're like, man, I really want to get this message across so we can stop doing this. What is, what is that, that mistake you commonly see in, in, uh, in coaches? Uh, I think for me, just when writing the book and talking to guys, it's just it's specifically in the team setting. I'll say, I think it's, um, not not being open-minded enough to to really talk to the coaches and understand what they know you know i've heard some guys say things like um you know like my, my positional coach for this position came up and asked if we could do some of this in in training and i was like no man like don't tell me how to do my job i know how to do my job and in my head i'm thinking like why would you say that to the coach man like that's such a perfect opportunity for you to say hey awesome idea man like uh, you know why what is it you want to see from that? Like, why, why would you suggest that? You know what I mean? And just start a, start a dialogue there so you can try to understand the coach's mind a little bit more because, I mean, we have to be honest in the team setting. Like, the strength coach is, is just not really that important, unfortunately. Like, it's, it's important to keep, the, to keep the health of the player in a good place. Like, we're, we're astronomically important for that. But ultimately, it's like when it comes to just, like, developing the player from a football standpoint, like, 
we don't really have much to do with that. So if the coaches are willing to talk to us, give some suggestions, things like that, I always think it's, it's just a great idea to talk to them and just start fostering that trust with them because, Hey, listen, like if he's, if he's asking you with like, say it's the D line coach and he's like, Hey, do you mind when we do sprints, we just bring out a scepter and you just move the ball. So they'd sprint off the ball. Like for you to be like, no, man, I have my program. I'm not going to do that. Dude, just, just do it, man. Cause then like now the D line coach is like, Hey, that's cool. Like he, he's into what I know. He's into my ideas. So now when you approach them with your ideas, they're more receptive to that. I mean, it's just, it's just basic human conversational stuff, but I think it just goes such a long way. Like when I talk to my NFL players, they'll talk about how they've been in situations where the football coaches don't talk to each other. And then the football coaches don't talk to the strength coaches. So everybody's just doing their own thing. You know, like they go to, they go to a team meeting and the head coach is like, we got to do this. Right. Then they go to their unit meeting and the coordinator's like, no, don't listen to him. Do it like this. And then they go to their individual meeting and there's a third thing that they're telling them to do. Like, don't listen to those two other guys. Listen to me. I know the answer. And then they're going into their lift where their strength coach is like, your coaches are idiots, man. Don't listen to them at all. Listen to me. I know, like, it's just, they, how are they not on the same page? You know, it's such a, it's, it seems so obvious when you think about it, that everyone should just kind of have the same message throughout the organization. Cause to me, like if I'm taking a guy through a workout and I'm like, Hey man, it's just like coach, whatever tells you, right? Like on the field, it's just like that, man. It's the exact same thing. So now he's going to practice. He's like, cool. Like coach sleeve told me that now coach X, Y, Z is telling me the same thing. I get it, man. Like I know what that means now when I'm out on the field, I, I just, I, when I'm in a workout, when I'm in practice, I know what it means. So I think the biggest mistake, honestly, is just open-mindedness and communication. And I got to commend you by the way, man. Cause I, I thought about it to myself where I was like, do I even have enough open-mindedness to try to talk to as many coaches as, as you do and bring coaches into my weight room so they can watch me and, and uh, what'd you call it? Audit my program or something like that. Yeah. You know, audit my program. that's dude. Like, that's like, you want to talk about like the juice as they call it. Like that's the freaking juice right there is just saying like, I'm open-minded enough to just hear everybody's ideas and then at the end of the day, I'm going to sit with my staff. I'm going to sit with my football coaches and we're all going to figure out what makes sense for us based on all these different ideas that we're pulling from, but we're never above anything anybody has to say. And I think that's, that's the biggest mistake is just being open-minded enough to have that approach. Yeah. And it comes down to like, what, what really are your goals? And I, 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 there's so many people that have a complete fallacy in their own mind of what they think their goals are. And my goals are, are, tried and true. I want what's best for our players and what's best for our program. And I don't admit that I know that all the time. And so if there's something that I'm not doing that's best for our program, I want to know because my ego is not most important to me. What's most important to me is that we're giving our players the best thing we can possibly give them at any point in time. And I think that it's absolutely, it's ego. It comes down to the fact that people need their ego stroked. Um, they need to know that they're doing a good job. People have too many freaking feelings in this world. Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm a, I'll, I'll skip all those things and just help me get better. And I think if that's your mentality, it's great, but that's, yeah, I mean, that, that's at the end of the day, that's what open mind it is. It's, it's, it's not having an ego. It's if your goal is truly to get better, then help me help you get better or please help me get better. And I think that's the, yeah, I mean, I think you nailed that cam. I, I, I was certainly thinking you were going to say like a training stimulus. I thought you were going to say like, oh, coaches are doing too much A, B, or C. And then you hit that. And I think that's that couldn't be stated better. And I couldn't agree more after I, I hear you say it is one, people are too freaking sensitive. You know, people people have too much too much ego. And it's just the truth. And I probably the biggest problem is the people that have the biggest egos don't freaking know they have them. And they don't even know that it's limiting them, them from, from growing, you know. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, you know, something I loved about when I went to visit you guys at Buffalo, um, you know, you weren't, you weren't standing there just talking about how, oh, you should see all the gadgets we have. Look at my program. Look how great it is. And, you know, first of all, like I asked you about that stuff and then you were, we were willing to talk about it, which was great. But the, the one thing that I picked up on as soon as I got there was you were talking about Mac championships. You know what I'm saying? So like you, you knew that like, the greater good is above like Matt Gildersleeve's strength program. Like you're like, we, we need to just like figure out what all the pieces are that we can put in place 
to help our guys win the freaking conference. And like, at the end of the day, like that's, that's what we're here for. Like what, you know, what are we doing? Who cares if my dudes are the biggest, strongest, most, most powerful guys. And I have all the data to prove it. And we, we go Oh, and 11 every year, you know, it's just like, what the hell's the point, man? Am, am I going to go on Twitter? Am I going to go on social media and be like, yeah, look at my studs. Look at these, look at these max velocities they were hitting. Look at the, the miles per hour that my guys hit, you know what I'm saying? And then, Oh, by the way, we just lost like five games in a row. So it's like, I don't care about that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like that stuff's important. We need to know if guys are fast and strong. We need to monitor that stuff. No question. But if we're not winning, like it's got to come in house or we got to talk more. We got to open up the doors. We got to bring people in that really know what they're talking about. Like, you know, like mobility, right? Like I'm not a mobility master. So I need to open up the door for somebody that is and talk to that person or call this coach who, who really knows his stuff about this field or whatever. And then it's on me to be the artist and try to piece it all together for what makes sense for what I'm trying to do. So, you know, I just, I just love how that's what you guys were talking about. was like, we're, we're here, we're trying to win the Mac. And like, that's, that's what it is. It's like everything is in, in our book, we call it the commander's intent, which is just like the head coach needs to win. We need to win the conference. We need to like, just make moves out here in terms of really, putting a stamp in college football at university of Buffalo. So how do we formulate the roads to get there? And that's all that matters. Yeah. I just, I just got done reading a book and it's probably one of the top five books I've ever read. It's called the program. And it's all about just pretty much developing culture and those kind of things. And one of the, one of the biggest things, it's not like it's something that you don't know, but for whatever reason, sometimes when you read things that hit you differently and it just talked about like how many leaders out there ask, other people to do things that they're not willing to do. And that's something that I, like I constantly, you know, if, if I'm, if I ask my staff, if I ask these guys to have thick skin and, and me be able to skip their feelings and just tell them when I think there's something that they can do better for our program, I need to be the same way. And if I'm sitting there and I'm constantly the one giving out advice to everybody else, but I'm not open to having someone come in and audit our program, I'm asking them to do things that I'm not willing to do. Um, and I think that's a that's a, a a big part of it too, right? Is you know you you think you have all the answers. Well, you better be willing to do the things that you're asking everybody underneath you to do, whether that be the players. You know, like I think a, a, a convenience. That's like a big thing. Is like a lot of coaches don't realize how much they care about their personal convenience, but they're the first ones to not give a shit when they make things not super convenient for their athletes. Um, and I, I see stuff like that all the time. But that's something that that Coach Leipold and I've been talking about a lot lately. Is is just how can we continue to develop that daily culture, not just from coaches to coaches, coaches to players, but I'm everybody in our department. Um, and like, like you said, keeping everybody on the same page, make sure everybody is sending the exact same message. And I think that's just as important as, as anything, you know, it's like talent, talent is great. If you don't have culture, you're not going to win. That's, that's what that is. So culture to me is, is first and all this stuff, come second it's a balance as always right right yeah you gotta you gotta put the system in place it's got to be based on you know putting people first and that includes you know putting the coaches first putting the players first like how everybody like the convenience factor you're talking about yeah like if everything's aligned and the communication is is all together that's going to be a pretty convenient system and for everybody that's going to work that day you know there's going to be a lot less stress and everything's going to run a lot more seamlessly and then once we have those big rocks in place from a culture standpoint, then we can put the big rocks in place from the specificity of how we go about uh, supporting that system too. I mean, like you think the new England Patriots have like the ultimate people at every single thing, like the world's greatest strength coach, world's greatest this or that. I mean, arguable, right? Obviously, but I can tell you one thing, like what Belichick's got going on there is a system that's in place and it, it, it runs itself really well all the coaches buy into what he's doing. The players are part of that system. And I mean, like, think about the magnitude of what he's doing. He's in professional football. This isn't like we out recruit other teams and just crush them with five-star players. This is like, everybody's a pro athlete and we're still winning Super Bowl after Super Bowl every single year. We're constantly in the picture. Like that's gotta be a cultural thing. It's gotta be, because what else would it be? Like the players are all just as good as the next guy. Like they're drafted and all that stuff. Physically they're there. They have the same technique and all that. But you just make sure that everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody feels like they're contributing in the right amount of, uh, you know, in the, in the same amount. And 
I mean, the more you read into what he's doing, it's amazing. Like, the, like from a culture standpoint, how they do it. Now, that doesn't mean it's not tough as shit. If you ask any player that played there, and they're like, hey, man, that was like a job. Like, that was tough. But I'll tell you what, I got like three rings on my hand right here. So it's like, what are you willing to trade? You know, ultimately, it's like you ask anybody who had an NFL career as a player that doesn't have a Super Bowl, they'll give up a lot of shit just to, just to have said they won a Super Bowl. So I think that's what it all comes down to is just having a, the right culture in place to take care of players and at the same time produce uh, on the field as well. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I, I don't want to not give my staff a chance to ask some questions from all the, the conversation stuff. So um, I've taken up enough of your time, but you guys have anything you guys want to add or any questions you guys have? Yeah, what's up, Cam? I, uh, I wanted to build off a little bit what you were talking about with, with open-mindedness and kind of wanted to just ask, you know, when, you, when you're presenting this type of, of game-based training to, to other coaches and, and they're not open-minded um, to that because it's so foreign to them, you know, what is, what is the most common, I guess the word backlash is that you hear or the, or the most common devil's advocate that is played to you uh, for not using that type of training? Yeah, that's a great question. The biggest one that both Fergus and I hear is, well, you know, we can't measure the progress of it because, um, you know, a lot of coaches are really interested in objective data. And, you know, I'm not going to fault people on trying to get objective data. I'll never do that. But what I tell them in response is I say, listen, like, you can monitor what's happening. You could even get, you know, a, a team manager to come and film that stuff, and you can go back and look at it if you want. But ultimately, like, those game activities are really based on pass-fail. You know what I mean? Like, there's not going to be a number associated with it maybe, um, but it's just like, did I get by the guy or did I not? Did I Was I able to cover that guy or was I not? You know, so it's just – it comes, it becomes about pass fail. When you think about like those, those game situations, you know, in, in football or any other sport, it's like, did I, did I make the play or did I not make the play? Right. Like that's what it comes down to. So that's the biggest backlash is that I think guys feel comforted by what they can measure. And I understand that I'm the same type of person. I'm totally type a OCD, all that stuff. I want to make sure I always have an idea of what's going on. Like one of my biggest character defaults, I like to control stuff too much. I'm really working on that, trying to open up my mind a little bit more. But, yeah, that's the biggest backlash I hear is that, you know, we just – we can't really measure it so well. So we're going to – you know, I don't know if it's really doing anything because it is. It's fuzzy. And a lot of times the athletes will be the best scale because any athlete I've put through all that those type of activities, they're always like, we need to do more of that. Let's do more of that. That feels, that feels like the game to me. I like the way that feels. So it's really subjective, but to me – that's like that psychological boost that a lot of those guys need. Would you say that, you know, along those lines, do you have more, for lack of a better term, backlash from performance coaches or, or guys in our position than you do from sport coaches because they understand that pass-fail type of, you know, measure? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, And that's what I think the – that's why I go back to that problem of communication where I think we need to talk to the sport coaches more because uh, – I actually get – I have more fun now talking to football coaches than I do talking to football strength coaches for the most part because football strength coaches are just so obsessed with numbers and objective data and all that. And I'm never going to say that's not important. Like, I'll never say that. But there's just a, a whole other side to the coin that we're not looking at, and that's like the game experience, right? Like, just – what these players experience when they're out there, like just the whole, all their senses are going off at the same time. They're perceiving something, they're reading it, they're reacting to it, they're having fun. You put players through these games, I guarantee you put a GPS on them. They're going to do a ton of work and they're not, their, their body language is going to be like really positive, really awesome. Like they might match the same amount of running as like 20 tempo runs, but it's just different because it's fun. It's more engaging. They're just really into it. A lot of times they don't even realize they're tired until you're like, all right, that's time. Let's, let's, let's walk out of here. And they're like, oh shit, I'm out of breath. You know what I mean? Like they're just, they're just in it. So it's about creating that, that player experience from my perspective. And, and sometimes that's coaches understand that because that's all they do. I mean, football practice is just completely like, let's just design stuff for subjectively what we think we need to do. And a lot, not a lot of it's objective at all. So coaches definitely buy into that a lot more than strength coaches for sure. Yeah. Just a, a few quick questions. Um, I know you said you were working backwards, um, like preparing, preparing for games. Um, one, have you ever 
kind of noticed a correlation with injuries or injury prevention. And a uh, little follow-up is uh, how you're saying you're in stressful situations. Have you ever noticed like a, ne a negative effect on their CNS, um, like kind of finding a way not to fry them, but get them that anxiety um, before, right before a game? Yeah, no, that's a great question because uh, a lot of that for me came through trial and error. So when I, I'll, I'll answer the second part of that question first about the negative effects on their CNS and all that. I had to trial and error to figure out the volume that worked for my guys in, in my setting here because I did start where I was like, let's do like X amount of minutes of games. Like I just threw it out there. I didn't know what the right volume was going to be. So, and then I'm talking to guys afterwards and there were, there were some times early on where we'd get back to the weight room and they're like, dude, don't tell me we're going to do any kind of lift because I'm fried right now. Like I'm done. Like after doing all my sprints and my jumps and my throws and my games and all that stuff. So I had to figure out like, all right, how do I, how do I find the minimum effective dose of everything, right? How do we give them just enough of everything? And, and I'm still working on that right now. You know, there's, there's no perfect system for that. Um, but definitely just, just being aware of how they're responding to that stuff. That was a big, big early on. And, and the other thing I realized in terms of, um, you know, like the injury prevention side of it is we understand in sprinting that we're probably going to use a short to long model. You know, we're going to start with shorter distances expose the players to shorter distances at high speeds and then gradually extend that out to where now they're, they're able to run, you know, maybe we start with 10 yards and we progress to 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards over time. Right. Um, where for the game stuff, it's the same thing. So we're going to start with smaller spaces. We're not going to allow them to move uh, over really large uh, movement distances uh, at first. So we just get them to have that reactionary component and then, as time goes on, we'll make the spaces bigger, just like we would for a short to long system in sprinting. So we're going to start with smaller spaces, go to bigger spaces, less complex activities to more complex activities. And that's how, um, in my experience, I've been able to progress that, the games, so that I'm, I'm accounting for the fact that I'm not throwing them into something that's too stressful too early, too much space too early you know, too much uh, speed combination of perceptual and physical speed. So that's the system I've used. And uh, our guys have been really healthy being able to play these games, be exposed to these, cha the, these chaotic moments. And truthfully, going through it myself, I'm able to feel how it is too. And so um, all that put together has really helped me try to figure out a nice balance as, as we were talking about earlier. The thing I think about too, Cam, is like I, I'm bad at this but I always think of like worst case scenarios or like, you know, we'll have a lift and I'll have 98 guys kill it. And there's two guys that were assholes on that day. And I'm like pissed and think it was a bad training session. And I think that inherently is like kind of how strength coaches are, or I just say coaches in general. So I know it's like a personal demon I got to get better with, but I know things that like, when I think about these tempo games, cause I remember you said that I wrote this down. Cause I remember you said this last time you were here, you talked about doing games for like tempo conditioning. It makes so much sense. And it's bar none the best, the best thing that I think you could probably do as far as sports specific movement and really prep, you know, giving them exposure for that stimulus. But the first thing that came to my head was I thought of two assholes on our team that would sit there and they wouldn't really compete. They would just like take it easy on each other. So it wasn't hard. And that my first, my first thing was like, nope, we're not going to do it because of those guys, even though it's better for the 98 other guys. And I think it's just, I'm just saying this out loud because it's something that like you need to get over that and instead of you know because i'm thinking well then we'll just do tempo so i know exactly how hard they're going i can control all those variables but the answer is 95 percent of your guys are going to do it the right way so why not give them the better stimulus and the better option and then if you have five guys that you don't trust just tell them they got to earn it make them go and make them do interval bike sprints while the rest of the team does fun games that's going to get them in better shape and they can sit there and run freaking sprints on the sideline and when they ask you just say i don't trust you I don't think you're going to go hard. I'm not going to sit here and babysit you. Um, I know I need. I know I personally need to get better at that, as you guys all know. That's and we talk about that all the time. Because um, that that's that stuff. I feel like that stuff keeps me from wanting to do things like this often. I'm so glad you said that because I'm the same way. Like I'll just be, I'll have, or or I'll, or I'll hop in sometimes with some of the guys if we need another body. And I'll have a bad day and I'll be like, screw this. Like, like just me personally. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, 
it's ridiculous that that we think that way but i totally like empathize with you on that front because there's so many things that i just have to teach myself to let the majority of the athletes tell me and realize that there's always going to be some guys that are either just a little bit different or they're outliers or they're just assholes or whatever and um yeah no to your point that's great Uh, like you're going to read that section in the book that uh talks about using games and you're going to think that you wrote that section because it sounds exactly like what you just said which is we we write in there and we say listen like this is supposed to be friendly fun competition so you got guys that are doing one of two things in these game situations in a big setting one they're going way too hard and they're trying to hurt guys right we got to pull those guys out like this is friendly competition like if guys are getting too intent like everybody's trying to make each other better and it's supposed to be fun so if guys start fighting each other you guys are out of here. You're going to go on the bike or you're going to go on the sled or you're going to go do some boring stuff. Right. And then the other guys are the guys that are just clowning around. They're not going too hard. So right. and you'll know, you know, from being around the same guys you're around, you know who you got to watch, right? Like when you're putting them in those, in those game situations. So if you got those guys that are sitting there and they're just like, Hey man, you go easy. I'm going to go easy too. It's like, those guys are not going to help you guys win a Mac championship. That's for sure. So guess what? Like, how do we punish those guys? we don't have to make them do freaking bear crawls, but it's like, listen, like if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But I'm still going to like stress your aerobic system somehow. I want to make you do it in a really monotonous way rather than having fun playing games with your friends. Like these guys are doing, you know, like which, what's your, what's going to be your choice ultimately. So I love that you said that. Cause that's exactly what we wrote in the book. No doubt. Question. Alan, what do you got for me? Sure. Yeah. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get my question off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really well, uh, Cam, I, question I had for you. So I just listened to you on uh, Joel Smith's podcast. Really enjoyed the talk that you guys had. Um, one concept I was just trying to wrap my head around, and would, wouldn't mind if you would love it if you could elaborate a little bit more on, is uh, just integrating, like, where in where, where do you see, let's say, single leg pile movements, jump movements uh, versus double leg? And the gist I kind of got from it, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it properly, is that by having two feet in contact with the ground, we're able to essentially produce more force and velocity than we can on one leg. So maybe that's a little bit more appropriate as we get closer to the season. Uh, just kind of curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought this up. I'm, that that podcast was kind of difficult because it was a roundtable discussion. Um, and Cal Dietz had some like crazy stuff he was talking about and that I was trying to wrap my head around too. But uh, basically my thought process with that was – um, thinking in terms of just the physics associated with it, the outputs. So I, the thought process behind it, and I'm, I'm going to write an article on this too over the next two weeks and try to put it out with some, with some examples of my thoughts on it. I'm not saying this is a perfect system. It just made sense to me in terms of measuring outputs. And it all, it all started uh, really where I was looking at some stuff from Derek Hansen where he was talking about ground contact as um, – utilizing ground contact time as a way to progress training. So I thought to myself, okay, let me take that concept from a power development standpoint. And we know that a unilateral plyometric or unilateral jump, it's going to have a lot longer ground contact time. It's going to be a lot more awkward. It's going to require a lot of coordination. There's going to be more time to produce force. So we're thinking about um, really like First, we're talking about producing force with a decent amount of time and progressing to how do we produce force with like no time available to us at all. So that's kind of the basis for the model in terms of like progressing from unilateral to bilateral emphasis. And it's sort of twofold. So um, if you look at any periodization model, if we're talking about a general prep period, it's always going to talk about building a base of coordination, exposing the muscle to longer time under tension, trying to work on hypertrophy, you know, even like tendon hypertrophy, which you can build with extensive jumps, which Berkoshansky sh- showed us that or explained that to us. So we want to build the body up with a foundation first of coordination, of strength, of, you know, balance, uh, tissue integrity, all that stuff. So to me, I was like, great, how do we can increase time under tension, coordination and balance, all that stuff using unilateral uh, exercises in the weight room as, a pr- as our primary strength exercises. Um, we're going to have some more leg soreness that we can expect, but that's, that's okay. Cause we're talking really early in the training process. And then when we're doing our jump work, we're going to use a unilateral model for that too, because we're going to have, uh, again, work in some coordination. There's going to be a balance component to that, but at the same time, it's going to be forced with, with more time, um, where, you know, it's just, it's, 
we're not going to be as fast off the ground off one leg than we would if we were doing like a bilateral hurdle hop or something like that. So I just started thinking of it that way. And the other side of that coin is going to be looking at what are we doing on the field, right? So I'm trying to concentrate my loading uh, as best as possible in terms of the training effect I'm trying to generate. So if I know on the field, we're going to start with, sh we're going to go short to long when we're in our short, if we're going like 10 to 20 yards or something like that, then that's going to have a nice force development effect as well, which Charlie Francis showed us that too. And that's where we can use our sled sprints our resisted runs, um, you know, expose our athletes to that kind of stuff. And then we can use, you know, single leg broad jumps, single leg pogo hops, things like that to just be on one leg and develop uh, the integrity of the ankle, the knee and the hip to handle multiple planes. And that's what I'm trying to do foundationally. Now, as the field work progresses to where we're going to go like beyond 20 yards, if we have skill work guys or uh, sorry, skill position guys, that's going to ultimately be our dominant single leg modality at that point, because I'm looking at it staggered with the use of change of direction and games as well. So if we touch on the fact that we're going to use smaller spaces with our change of direction work with our games work earlier on, it's the same kind of idea of a short to instead of short to long, it's small to big basically in terms of field space that we're using. So it, when the field is small, we might change direction more frequently, but we're not going to have as, as intense, of a change of direction because the speeds aren't that high. Now, as we make the field bigger, our change of direction is going to be really intense. So what we're doing by using that unilateral work earlier on is building the foundation of power, strength, and control that can be effectively realized later when we're really emphasizing power and speed. When we have much higher sprinting speeds, we're, we're basically building a better spring off the ground when we're when we're sprinting at high speeds when we're asking our athletes to change direction in larger spaces they can decelerate and reaccelerate a little bit better because they now have the tissue integrity to handle that and now we're just realizing the foundation we've built by exposing them to that similar action at a much higher speed much much higher power much higher force absorption and transfer so the unilateral stimulus becomes more field dominant later on in like power and speed type of phases and then to reduce soreness as a result of that later on in the program, let's go in the weight room and, and start doing some more stuff on two legs now, um, jumps included, so we can reduce some soreness, but then the speed of uh, takeoff and the speed off the ground is going to be conducive to what we're seeing on the field. So like a bilateral hurdle hop, the speed off the ground is going to be a lot more similar to the speed off the ground when we're sprinting at high speed. So it's just, it's basically taking like a block model and concentrating the volume, but it's just based on the training effect more so than like the true like Russian block periodization. It's more about just creating a, a staggered vertically integrated training effect where the emphasis is there. And like, what are we emphasizing? If it's power and speed, then we can emphasize that with bilateral jumps because the power is going to be higher. The speed off the ground is going to be higher. Even with a squat, like the movement of the bar is going to be faster than a, Bul a Bulgarian split squat or something like that. So that was the whole thought process behind it. Interesting. So I guess to kind of build off then a little bit, like you hear some people say like, oh, we got to train on one leg as we get closer to the season because we spend a lot of time on one leg. But I, let me make sure I'm understanding this right. From your perspective, it's more of a uh, – Kin uh, more of a kinetics thing, like a force force output standpoint, as opposed to the kinematics thing of you know, trying to match that, oh, we're on one leg. It's let's try to match the forces that we might see. And, and that's what we're not going to be able to get that in the weight room with your traditional single leg type exercises. Correct. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you look at the general prep period in any periodization model, we're talking about building a base, right? So, yeah, we can we're going to build a base of unilateral control earlier on. But if you look at the, what they talk about in specialized preparatory periods, you know, later, like right before you enter competition phase, so that could be like right before training camp, for example, what are we focusing on at that point? It's adding more sports specific uh, just activities in general. We want to see a lot of power and a lot of speed as it relates to movements associated with the sport. So for me, it just doesn't make sense if we're thinking field first, weight room second, I, that argument doesn't make sense to go on one leg closer to the season in the weight room. Instead, it makes more sense to me to just intensify the field work so it's more game-like in nature where we're using larger spaces, higher speeds of sprinting, things like that. So the unilateral stimulus 
becomes about what we're doing on the field at that point from a specificity standpoint. And because we're jacking up the specificity on the field, and that's going to be like our most intense form of training at that point, the weight room now is really just more supportive. But how do we keep the nervous system thinking in terms of like just fast, explosive, we put them on two legs. So that's going to help us from the kinetic standpoint have the same type of outputs that we want to see. But now we're spreading it across more musculature on the body. So the legs aren't going to be as sore. Um, and it's just going to help us uh, just, you know, align everything together for the same type of training effect that we want. That's that's really good stuff, Cam. We could probably spend about another hour just talking about that, which maybe we'll just do this again here soon. But we got a couple minutes, Cam. We got to head to a staff meeting here. But I'd, I want to try to keep this thing targeted to younger coaches. And I feel like sometimes when we start talking, we get away from that a little bit. But let's at least end with something here. So as we wrap up, let's just uh, – What's a piece of advice or something of advice you'd give to a, a young coach coming up in this, in, you know, an intern uh, type position, an assistant trying to move up? What is what is a, some advice you would you would give to them? And it could be you take this any direction you want. But if you could give somebody a piece of advice that's coming up in this industry, what would it be? Well, I can just I can speak from experience and just talk about my faults when I was a young coach. And uh, one of my biggest faults was that I read about two books and thought I knew everything. So um, I would say that there's just there's so much to learn about what really matters as it relates to developing sports performance. And you're always going to have to think outside of just your immediate silo or your immediate bucket of thinking. So if you're coming up in a weight room environment, the first thing you're going to think about is how do I do the right stuff in the weight room, which, yeah, absolutely. Start learning about what that what that is. Learn how to teach guys how to how to squat, how to bench, you know, how to how to just lift. Of course, at some point, you got to learn that stuff. But the biggest thing for me is really just always maintain a mentality that the rabbit hole is always deeper than you think it's going to be. So just keep diving down it and take your time. You know, I think a lot of a lot of coaches nowadays, and I was this way, too, when I was like 23, 24, you know, I, I was like, I'm ready to just like run everything. Right. And at 28 now, I'm, I'm realizing how much I really just don't know. And it's in talking to you even, right? Like, cause I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm in the private sector. I'm not even in the college sector. So when I talk to other coaches that are in different settings, I think that's a huge thing too, because that, that'll really humble you quick to where they're dealing with problems that you're not dealing with. So you're, you might think you've got some answers, right? You might start getting confident. And I always say, you got to talk to other coaches to realize that there's, there's always more things to think about and, uh, you know, I'm fascinated at this point in my career by solving problems that, that are just in all in different scenarios, different places. So for me, it's really just don't, don't get in the mindset that you really know what's going on. Like, just keep talking to people, keep doing what you're doing, which is, you know, hosting people in your weight room, listening to other people. And it doesn't matter how old they are either. You know, you could be 30 years old and there could be a 25 year old kid that tells you something that you're like, wow, I never thought about that before. Cause everybody's brains work differently. So don't write anybody off. You know, don't, don't assume that people don't have something to offer. Like you might work with a staff that, you know, yeah, I don't like that guy from university of whatever. Cause I, I just, I don't like the way he is. It's like, well, maybe there's still something I can learn from him. There's an experience he's gone through that maybe 98% of what he's saying, is just kind of like, all right, like, I don't know if I agree with this, but then the other 2%, he might give you something that's, that's really important to understand. You know, like if you're, if you're just, if you're always able to explore and just always open-minded to it, I mean, it's, you hear coaches talk about it all the time, but I'm just speaking from experience that I was not open-minded enough uh, when I first got into the field. And there's some people that I talk to now and I confide in that when I was younger, I was like, yeah, what do they know? You know what I mean? And it's just, it's just crazy. Cause I start talking to these guys in person and I'm like, they, they know so much. They've, they've seen some things I've never seen. I'm not better than these people. So um, yeah, it's just, it, it comes back down to communication in general, like how we were talking about before is just always allow yourself to communicate, allow yourself to listen. Don't be, don't try to be the first one to talk. Just listen to what people are telling you and then ask questions and, and then talk from there. So, such, such a true piece of advice. And I hope that people can, can truly take it and, uh, and apply it. But Cam, as always, man, it's always a pleasure. And I wish we could do this more often, and we seriously should. I, I really want to try to schedule something to pick up where Coach McNally left off there with that, that conversation. But, man, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate you.